Welcome to Club E. Hi, I'm Rick Brimacombe. I am your architect of business growth, and I will work with you to unlock your potential and amplify the scale of your company. Today, we are discussing the director series board topics of today. And part two is how to get on a board of directors. Again, our goal is for the director series to support emerging and middle market companies and those in the business ecosystem who assist with their success. I want to thank our sponsors, Irish Titan, an e-commerce and web development firm, Highland Bank, a locally owned community bank, Romaine Berg, a digital marketing agency. To participate in the comments section, make sure that you are watching on YouTube. And while you're there, please subscribe and hopefully hit the like button as well. We need your help. So please just take a moment. I'll wait for you. By hitting that button will allow us to deliver better content to you as well as let you know when we're going live. You can also now catch Club E on your favorite podcast platform, Apple, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, and many others. First, I'd like to introduce our two guests today, Jim Zelke and Ann Sample. Welcome. Thanks, Rick. Love to be here. Thanks, Rick. Jim is founder and president of Cardinal Board Services and my co-host of the Director Series, and Ann Sample is CEO of Navigate Forward. You can reach out to them directly. Their contact info is in the comments field. And also it's Jim Z at cardinalboardservices.com as well as Ann with an E at navigateforward.com. Um, again, you can find their contact info in the comments field as well as put your questions to participate in our conversation today. All right, with that, let's uh, turn it over to our guests. Uh, first of all, why don't you two tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your firm, the various things that you're up to. And Jim, since you are the co-host in the director series, let's start with you. Well, thank you, Rick. And like I said, I really enjoy being here. Had a great session last time. Look forward to the future ones. Uh, I know Ann well. We've known each other for a number of years. And uh, one of a cohort, cohort here in the Twin Cities for doing board work. So that uh, I'm glad that Ann gets to join us today. Uh, I run a company called Cardinal Board Services. We primarily work with companies who ask us to go out and find directors. So finding you know, directors that maybe even people that have never served on the board is part of our mission in life. Uh, plus we do a lot of gov governance uh, work as well and consulting. So it's a pretty robust business and it's growing every day because it's a more active part of small business. And? Thanks, Jim. And thanks, Rick, for the invite. I really appreciate the opportunity to join you. I'm Ann Sample. I'm a former corporate executive, a chief HR leader who's now an entrepreneurial business owner. Um, currently, as the CEO of Navigate Forward, I've worked to establish our long-term growth strategy for this firm, serving leaders across the globe. Uh, previously, I was the head of HR at three different local companies, Pepsi Americas, Thrivent, and Caribou Coffee and Bagels. And I've spent lots of time in the boardroom in those corporate roles, as well as serving on a board myself. Um, my firm, Navigate Forward, provides highly customized support to senior execs who are currently in transition, planning change, or looking for board service, which is why I'm so interested in talking about this topic today, because board readiness is our fastest growing, it's really our fastest growing practice area. Great. Well, for our listeners and viewers out there, I've worked personally both with Jim and Ann, so I can speak firsthand to the value that their firms can provide. And I'm sure if either one of those two you can help you move forward, you will find um, a good partner uh, with Jim and Ann on that front. Um, all right, so let's start with our questions. Again, a reminder for folks, if you're in YouTube, you can put questions in the comments field. We've already gotten a few that I'll weave into our conversation and we have a robust uh, list of questions here that we're gonna work through. Um, so let's start by just um, the kind of the base level question is, how does somebody prepare to search for a board position? And since Anne, that's uh, what you folks do, let's start with you. Okay. You know, I think, Rick, it, it really starts with having people think about why they want to serve on a board and how they would answer that question if they were asked. Um, it's amazing to me how often people jump in and haven't thought about that question, which is one of the first things they're going to face. And so our suggestion is start by assessing your availability. Uh, board roles sound like a great idea, but make sure it fits on your plate. Make sure you've got the time to do it well. And then we would suggest that you start with, you look two directions, start with a market assessment, 
Think about the types of companies that would really benefit from your capabilities. And then there's lots of tools out there. We have a proprietary one for self-assessment, but what you really wanna do is assess your skills, take an inventory of your past experience, because if you have a clear view of companies that would benefit and where you can add value, I think that's the best starting point. Jim, what do you think? So great thoughts, those are dead on right. I, I, I think of, uh, you, you need to ask yourself why you wanna do it and it has to be a, and you have to be comfortable. There's a mutual benefit to serving on a board. There's the benefit of, of what you give them, but there's a benefit of what you get back. And so it's got to go, got to go both ways. And it's never, I've yet to ever recruit a board member where it's about the money. It's never about the money. So if you think it's about the money, don't even start because you'll never be satisfied. It'll, it'll, and you'll get more value than money that you get from the board. Yeah, and Jim, uh... I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say the one last thing is, if you in your life today are, are a mentor and you like to mentor people, then you're probably, that's one big step. There's lots of them, but that's one thing. If, you're not, if you've never mentored or you don't like mentoring people, you're not gonna like being on the board. Mm. Yeah, because the compensation and the time that folks put in, you say, oh gee, the board meeting is three hours and um, a lot of money for three hours when in reality, the prep work and all the ancillary right. meetings and conversations, um, it's, it's, it's a time consuming uh, uh, process, that's for sure. Yep. So uh, Jim, um, why don't we start with you? Um, actually, I'm gonna shift it up. And how about you? Let's talk a little bit about how is searching for a board position similar, or maybe it's different from looking for a high level job? You know, I think it. Um, there are some ways it's similar. I think you have to be really prepared with your narrative, your market message, you know, what, what as you describe your value add, that has to be, you have to have that clean and clear and concise. You've got to have great documents and you've got to have a networking plan. And I think that's the same. Those are those things carry across between job search and board search. But what I think is different is I think the language and the tone that you use in those documents and those conversations need to be really different. Um, we've talked to lots of people that, um, you know, we often talk to candidates when they've gone on board interviews, not gotten the job, but they've actually gotten the, not gotten the board offer, but the person says, Hey, we'd like to have you on the, on the leadership team. So what that tells me is what needs to be different about your search is you need to use a really different language. Um, and I think while your resume can be the same, I think a board bio is very different and has to be really targeted. And, and for the board readiness uh, program that you run, how long does that take? Um, well, to get ready, it really depends on the amount of time the person has to spend on it. We've learned it takes about 12 to 18 months to actually land on a board from the time you get started. Um, but preparing your documents, getting your market message, you know, if you really focus on that, you can do that in a couple of months. But as we know, most people are balancing the demands of a full-time job. So some of our clients take longer because they're trying to fit it in between their huge responsibilities. So Jim, how about you? How do you view the search for a board position versus um, a high level job and how are they similar or different in your mind? I think it's the, the I think I like to think about the differences. It's all brain and no brawn. So think about when you come in to be, whether it be the CFO, the COO, the VP of sales, you know, it's gotta be brain, but you got the brawn because you gotta run the organization. When you're coming to a board, you're not running the organization. So you have to be, really using a lot of brain and a lot of personality. And, and it's really all about insight first, experience, compassion. And then the last one is, is sometimes harder, it's truth telling. And you have to be, there's, a, um, there's an old saying truth to power. And, uh, and what, what they mean is you've gotta be the one, you gotta maybe be the one truthful voice in the board meeting to challenge people on what they're thinking about. And, and that's really, really important as a board member. So that's different than a, a typical executive who's got a lot of different factions that they've got to keep happy and you got to lead people. This, this is a different, different experience. Yeah. Um, uh, much uh, the same of uh, asking questions and providing perspective versus actually doing. 
Exactly. Almost influence, right, Jim? It's a it's yeah. an influence strategy with a lot of uh, forethought in terms of how you how you bring put those thoughts on the table. Questions are often the best ways that board members engage. Exactly. So uh, we've touched on a little bit here about how people are looking to join boards uh, while they're st still working full time. Talked a little bit, uh, touched on, you know, gee, that's a lot of time involved with the boards. How much time in your experience do you think folks need to uh, have available to join a board and then not only be on the board, but being a contributing active member? Uh, Jim, let's start with you. So I, I have a, a rule of thumb and it's about 80 hours per year for a private, you know, fun, fully functional board position. So think about 80 hours a year is, is your two week vacation per year, but you don't use it in, use it in smaller chunks. You do, you know, you might have, you know, one day of recorders, a board meeting um, because, you, and then, but you have preparation beforehand, you have calls in between, they're kind of chunky. So you need to be able to have flexibility in your schedule, your executive schedule, or you can take you, know, you can take those days off. The good news is most boards publish their board of directors uh, the, the dates that they're meeting a year to year and a half in advance. So you already know those and get them into your calendar right away. But you know you got to make sure that there's no conflicts in your calendar. So about 80 hours a year. But if you're if you get fortunate enough to be on a publicly uh, traded board, um, it's going to be two x to three x. It's because there's a lot more committees. There's a lot of other work you have to do as a public company. So, uh, but you can figure it's at least 80 hours a year. Now, Anne's got, I know she's got experience, but I'm curious what you think, Anne. Yeah, I think, and, and it could be part of it's the difference. Um, I would say part of it would be a difference, private, public, and also part of it is, so when we talk to folks, we tell them they need to have 300 hours a year free, which I know is a frightening number. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what we're including and things are a little different these days, because in that calculation, we were talking about travel to board meetings, the prep work you need to do, the board dinners. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're on the board, part of what happens is there um, there's an informal touch base before every meeting with the CEO, with the leader. So mm -hmm. we're really counting up all of those hours. Um, and I think any way you look at it, it's a significant time commitment. But I think what Jim raised, so the, so the first question is how much time? And then the other question is how does it coordinate with your full-time work schedule? Because as Jim noted, you know, recognizing if there's any conflicts is one thing you have to, to, to look at and make sure that there aren't any um, you know, conflicts of interest that are gonna arise. And it's really funny, if you can find a board that has a different fiscal year, whose board dates differ, whose board cycles differ, because um, there is, you do not want to get into the position of, am I going to my own company board meeting or a board that I serve on? Um, and so it's important to really check calendars at that level of detail as well. And, you know, that's a good point, Ann, because I just happened this week is, you know, a, a chief marketing officer for my, one, a large insurance company here in the U.S. was a candidate for one of our board searches. And I said, well, there's two major things you have to do. And this is something that everyone should be aware of is you need to go ask your CEO or your chief legal officer, am I able to serve on this board? Make sure there's no conflicts of interest just in business-wise, but then it's also the board dates because that CMO re always does a report at their company's board meetings every time. And sure enough, it took them two weeks to get it all worked up, came back, said, sorry, can't pursue this because the, your client's board dates align up exactly with when our board, board meetings are, so I can't not be there. So when you're a senior executive, you know, you need you need to make sure you know how to go get approval to be on the board and what your board dates are because you're probably presenting to your own. And then a reminder to everybody out there that if you're in YouTube, you can submit questions. Also hit the uh, subscribe and hopefully the like button and uh, join our Club E community. We have had a couple of questions come in. So want to get to a couple of those. Kelly was asking about, we've been talking about time here. Kelly wanted to know about the typical board term. Um, so, uh, Jim, let's start with you. What do you see as a typical uh, board term? There is none. It could be could be year to year. It could be three year terms, and you can't go more than can't be reelected more than two or three times. I can tell you the average um, the average experience on a board of all across all industries is about eight point five years. A typical board member has served on their board for about eight point five years, but 
once again, it's a good question to ask. It shows you're thinking. If you're potentially get to interview with them, say, do you have terms? And do you have term limits? Do I have to retire at a certain age? Do I have to, you know, or do I only get to serve for so many terms? It's it's pretty, it's pretty much all over the map, but it's a good question to know about. And Anne, are you seeing anything different? No, I think Jim's spot on. You know, I think the other, uh, maybe the other thing to be aware of is sometimes boards will use, um, you know, they'll appoint somebody partway through somebody's term to give you a, really to give you a tryout or to, you know, to give you some more experience. But sometimes their need is a business need that's not going to last for perpetuity. Um, and so it's very important as you're having the conversation to find out what the company's expectations are on term limits up front. All right. And then just uh, from my own um, experience, typically I have seen three years on the for-profit side for myself and four years on the nonprofit side. Mm -hmm. But again, it's all over the board, but those were my experiences. Another question from Alvin, um, we're jumping back to the financially rewarding stuff. And a question was, if you receive some sort of equity, uh, does that then make the board assignment uh, more financially rewarding? And uh, he uh, acknowledged in his question that you don't do it for the money as we talked about, but maybe talk a little bit about various compensation structures for board members. Yeah, ahead, Jim, Ann. do you wanna, do you wanna, oh, I was gonna say, I think there's, again, it's, it's so highly variable, especially with, um, you know, I think on public companies, um, board, board pay is more, um, it's more consistent. It is more lucrative, but much, much harder to get those roles. Um, I think equity is a great tool for companies to use. I'm going back to my HR experience. And, you know, when we were recruiting board members, we found equity kept our board members incredibly aligned because it made them shareholders. And, and therefore, it's a great alignment tool. Um, but typically, you're not able to do anything with that equity until the end of your term. Um, you're required to hold. And so it can be valuable. But, um, but I'm going to go back to Jim's comment, which is, you know, the, you can make a living doing board work if you think of this as a portfolio of boards. Um, I think that is a place where you can supplement income. As you think about adding a board to your full-time roles, it's not something you're going to do for the economics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I would add to it, Anne, is that I've seen it literally all over the board, but can, the one kind of consistency is if you're going to go on a, you know, a venture funded or a startup board, Rich knows this a lot because he's worth it. It's going to be all get equity. <laughs> it's going to be all equity because they don't have any money, Right. But typically, a private company that's an ongoing concern you get on the board is going to be mostly um, all cash. If you go to then a private equity company that's a going concern and a private equity firm owns it, they're going to probably do all equity again. And then it's a combination typically on a public board. Uh, the one situation that everyone should be aware of is sometimes private companies give you, they can't really give you equity because it's maybe it's privately held by a small group of people. They can do uh, phantom stock or tracking stock. And then sometimes they do that. Uh, but it's, it's like Ann says, I like the idea because it gets everybody aligned with the success of the business. And that's really good. And then for family owned businesses that layers in another wrinkle and Jim, probably uh, your answer about phantom stock is a way to go there because yeah. Most of the time in a family owned business, they're not going to want to issue it. Right. right. So, Anne, um, with your board readiness practice, um, talk a little bit about self assessment. Um, what, what's the process that candidates should use, go through, so that they identify and capture the value that they can bring to a board? You know, we suggest that this is this is one of those activities you want to set aside some time to to really focus on it. And you want to make sure that you think about, um, as I said, we've got some proprietary tools, but there are some great board self assessment tools um, that are available. And I think they often have categories. I mean, part of what they're going to ask you to categorize is really sit down and think about your experience and your credentials. How big have the P&Ls been that you've managed? How many people? what kind of roles, you know, take some time to categorize the credentials. And then we think it's really important to look through some core competency areas that are important to boards. So um, look at your financial acumen and look what you can, you can say with great validity about your, the financial expertise and acumen you bring. Think through your independence, 
look at examples of thought leadership, think about governance. Those are, those are four categories of competencies where we ask people to take it apart. And the benefit of that is if you take the time to really build that inventory, it makes it a lot easier to then pull that into your market message, pull it into your bio. Um, you know, so it's, it's not as simple as just going back and looking at an old resume. It's probably looking across your career and really doing an assessment of what you bring to the table. Jim, anything you'd like to add there? Yeah, I think, you know, Ann used a word that I quickly, I, you know, identify with, and that's financial acumen. It's the core to every single board meeting you go to. You're always co covering the financials. You need to read them ahead of time, pick up some things as well. But then, on, because what's changing, and the good news is for any of the people that are watching is, it used to be you had to have a C in your title for them to want you on the board. You have to be a CEO or a CFO. Now we're going after people that have bring a market, you know, expertise to it. So you need to have some level of what you are you an expert on? What's one or two or three things in a business? And that makes you really valuable. It could be, you know, it could be, um, you know, digital marketing is a hot topic right now. So you look at financial acumen, you look at, you know, your core competency and where you're an expert, but then there's that one thing, it's called the X factor. What's the X factor that you have? Is it that you've done M&A work? Is it the fact that you've uh, done both startup and Fortune 500 companies. There's, there's something everybody brings that's unique and that's got to, you need to make sure that's brought out as well because that could be the difference between um, joining the board or not. I know with one of the companies that, that we did some work for, the, the board person we hired, I, I thought, now this one may or may not be, quit, be a good fit because kind of has a, um, you know, a pretty aggressive personality and aggressive look at doing business. And the CEO goes, that would be wonderful. We're all so comfortable with each other on the board. I would like somebody that's going to get in there and shake it up. So mm. being true to yourself, but know what you're good at and being the, that is, could get you the, that's the difference that could get you on that X factor. So uh, Jim, going back to our last session, the first part of this series, I actually talked about the Blue Jay uh, personality, <laughs> that one of accountability. So that's just what you, uh, you hit on there. Yeah. Um, so um, now that candidates have gone uh, through a process to better understand themselves and the value they bring, how does somebody go about actually uh, beginning the process about preparing to join a board? Again, Anne, with, with your practice, let's start with you. Um, you know, I think it's, um, and I'm not sure, I think what I was still thinking, of, I'm, as I thought about your question, I thought about it as getting on a board. Um, so let me make sure I'm answering the question you're asking, Rick, which is it in terms of how do you start the process of getting on the board or how do you start the process of actually getting onboarded? I think we want to talk about uh, getting on a board. Okay. So if somebody's, um, if somebody's focusing on getting on a board, I think it comes back to you've got that inventory, you know, you've got that sheet of paper with those traits, some of the ones that Jim just highlighted, the things that are really unique. And it's, it's almost like uh, when you're crafting a great message, you know how you put, um, first you put it all out there and you start with that big assessment and then you bring it back to focus and you create a really clear market message, a really clear elevator speech. And, and our suggestion is write it down, draft it, share it, practice it with people who know you well, who can call BS if there's, you know, if there's something you're highlighting that that they don't agree with, they can tell you. And what we found is oftentimes it's the thing that you're really good at that you forget to put in your market message. Because when somebody is really good at something, it likely comes more easily for them. And they think it's easy for everybody. And so that's why we like the idea of sharing it with people who know you well, so you can refine it. And so my thought would be get a really clear market message, create a board bio, and then get out there and start networking, but start with people who know you well, because you're going to fumble it a couple times in your first few networking meetings around boards. I mean, it's just a, it's a different kind of conversation. Um, and so, you know, practice it with people who know you well so that you can get good at it because you're going to want introductions from them to people you don't know and folks you're going to want to be talking to about your interest in board service. Jim, uh, how about thoughts from you on this? Um, and especially given your perspective as a board recruiter, I'd also uh, be curious in asking, do you actually want people contacting you directly to share their credentials or do you prefer to seek people out who are 
um, uh, fit a particular search that you're actively involved in? So uh, it's a, it's a, that's a hard question because I don't want to I don't want to come off as somebody I don't care if people you know reach out to me want help but but I probably can't help them because eighty percent of all board positions get filled through personal networking. That's how they get filled. So it's not a very productive use of anyone's time to, to give it to me. Um, and there's never a shortage of, of people that want to serve on boards, are there any? They're just never a shortage. Every, a lot of people want to. But I will tell you that uh, the most important things that a potential board candidate can do is number one, be prepared. Literally, if you get the call or if you hear about something, don't sit around and think it's going to happen in the next three, four weeks. You got to uh, you got to deal with it now. And how can you deal with it? You better have a board bio already. You 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 also need to upgrade your LinkedIn profile. LinkedIn people find board seats by by people finding them on LinkedIn. That's a real that's a reality, just like your career. But you, so there's a way to write a LinkedIn profile that's more board centric, and so that's important as well. But you need to know who you are and what value you bring and be able to do that elevator speech, except it's gotta be even shorter than the four minutes ride in the elevator. It's gotta be a quick 30 seconds. And, and what, why would they be important? Why would it be important for me to wanna to talk to you about it when I pick up the phone and call you? Jim, oh. can I interject for a second? Cause I think you're being really kind as a recruiter and it's, it, it always amazes me cause whether it's job search or board search, um, you know, everybody knows a recruiter. Everybody has a recruiter that's a good friend or somebody that's called in the past. And it's, it's always fascinating, fascinating to me when candidates say, I know Jim, he's going to find me a board role. <laughs> and I'm like, Jim is a great guy. And if he gets a board role that matches exactly with your specifications, yeah. you're right. But, but that's not actually what recruiters get paid to do. Um, and so I think the very best recruiters do what Jim does. He's very generous. I think he, you know, he does a really nice job of helping people think about how to increase their chances. Um, but you can't rely on a search strategy or expect your, um, you know, those, those search partners to do the work for you. That's right. Because they're not going to get paid by it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Anne, talk a little bit more about the materials that people need to develop so that they stand out as a candidate, why the board bio uh, is so important that, that you help folks with. And then also, Jim brought up LinkedIn. Talk a little bit about how folks can use LinkedIn. I'm glad to. I think board bios are the most important document you can, you know, again, a document isn't going to get you the board seat. It's going to be networking and having the document having sent it beforehand, having it in your hand. Um, a board bio is a really impactful document. It's easy to digest. It's not long. It's, you know, it might be a couple of pages or something front and back. Um, and it's got to really support, it's got to make you memorable. So I like that word. I think Jim used that word. Um, you know, when we, what we do when we work with folks on a board bio, we think it's a place to put a really professional photo that statement that captures your value proposition. So we've used words like value proposition, market message, elevator speech. It's all the same thing. It's that super tight statement, statement about the value you add. Um, and it is not a resume. It's a, you know, accomplishments that demonstrate your thought leadership and your interpersonal style. It's education and core competencies, but just at a very high level. Um, and so the board bio, think of it as the cliff notes that you're gonna hand to somebody um, that they can walk away with that clear picture of who you are. So we think, we think that's the most important tool, but what's really interesting, and I think what's changed the most over the last couple of years is that people are using LinkedIn. LinkedIn is really critical to a board search. Um, and I think that often um, executives who are further in their career aren't necessarily using LinkedIn with the same kind of proficiency or frequency but we think you have to have a profile that stands out. You've got to have your settings in the right places so that you, um, you know, so that you look like you know what you're doing with LinkedIn. And then you need to think about how you can use LinkedIn as a tool because there's ways you can really use it to stand out as a board candidate, you know, by the things that you like, by the things that you post, by the people that you're connected to and the people you follow. Um, we do not recommend Sometimes when people come to talk to us about LinkedIn, they're like, oh, I'm not gonna accept invites from all these people I don't know. 
And we don't want you to use, we don't recommend that you use LinkedIn to build out a big network of people that don't know you. That's not what it's for. It's getting your profile right and then using it to stand out. Jim, do you have other, isn't it funny how much LinkedIn has, Yeah. I mean, it just wasn't five years ago, we weren't talking about this as important for executives. And I think it's become so much more important. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I've seen it be, be a real game changer. And uh, so, so I, I think the, the, the interesting you point out, I'm going to go to LinkedIn second, but the interesting you point out about the board bio. So it's, when you explain it to people, they kind of scratch their head. It's kind of halfway between the profile you have on the website and your resume. I've had people send me their board bio. It's just their resume. It's like, I don't care. That's, you, you have to have, you don't, you're not showing thought leadership by sending me your resume, by the way. You have to boil it down into the succinct points, just like you have to be like that on a, in a, a board meeting. You need to ask good questions. You need to be a, a bigger thinker. Well, that's what a board bio is all about. And going back to the kind of the comments from earlier, you by going through and building it, it, it writes it in your own brain. So when you get the call, you can, you can have your value proposition and you have it at your fingertips so you can send it. Now, I, this, is the, this is the only time in life you get to put a picture on there. You don't put your address, you don't put your home, you don't put your phone number and you can actually say things about your family. I mean, that's a, that's a typical board bio. Well, they wanna know about you as a person, not just what you are inside your job. They wanna know about 24 seven. So it's an interesting thing to have. Um, now switching to LinkedIn, I think that's very true. You know, you know, LinkedIn is your personal business brand. And so if you think your business brand's got to change, you got to use LinkedIn. Anybody that comes to me, I tell them, go see Ann Dreyer. She is the queen of LinkedIn. She knows how to get your profile set so it looks really good. And, and she's, and she's kind and she's very confident in doing that. I, and then you also have to, uh, then you have to like a lot of different companies like a navigate forward and you need to you need to, to be able to to be connected to the board communities nacd private director association and then things will start coming towards you and that's what linkedin's all about you have to build out the network not just people but companies so a reminder to our audience that's out on youtube you can put questions into the comments field we have a couple of other questions um want to uh touch base on a question that um, Rick W, longtime listener and supporter of Club E, uh, put out there was, is there a specific online place to either list that somebody's available for board positions and interested in board positions or to post a search? Um, so what online tools, if any, are available uh, regarding board positions? I'll, I can take a shot at that, Jim. Do you want to go first or? Oh, nope, you go ahead. I'll follow up. Because um, I think we, we had a conversation about this um, as we were prepping and, you know, it would be wonderful if there were a place you could go and just type, you know, just send your board bio in and you're going to get opportunities. Um, I, I want to reiterate, we really, really find people get board roles through networking. And so you can use LinkedIn as a way to make it clear that you're interested in boards and that might make it a tool that can work. There are, you know, there are organizations you can, if you're a member of NACD, there's a great tool, you fill in your profile, um, but I don't know anybody who's been called for a board role using it. Um, Private Directors Association has a really, what they have is a great mechanism for finding out about roles that are available so there are more um, there are more online tools for finding out about board roles through places like P the Private Directors Association or women on boards. Um, but I think in terms of being able to put your profile in and thinking that you're going to pop out on somebody's, um, you know, I want a new board member list. I don't think that exists and isn't. It's not a really effective thing in the market right now. Have you found anything, Jim? I haven't. I haven't. Matter of fact, I've been approached. I'm sure each one of us has been approached by. There's uh, there there's an online uh, board search business, they say, hey, we, we filled so many positions and you should join us and be a part of it. For $100 a month, you can do that or 50, I don't even know what it is, the cost. I've yet to ever find anybody has gotten a board role for me, but, but they'll, take your, they'll take your information professionally and they'll take your money. And then probably six months later, you're gonna try to quit and they're gonna make it hard for you to quit. So 
even <clears throat> so it's got a bad rap too. So I think that's the other thing to stay with. Me. It's just get comfortable. It's up to you to find the board opportunity. And I'm gonna I'll put a big plug in because I'm part of the executive committee at Private Directors Association is that's the best what place you can probably join. And because it's all about networking too. Once yep. we can meet in person, the networking pieces of those sessions you go to 10 a year, you're gonna find out about opportunities. And PDA is also sending them, all their members get, I got two last week of new boards seeking, seeking opportunities, so. So uh, I think I in general, if somebody's charging you to be on a list, yeah, not a good. I thing. haven't found one of those that's effective. Yeah, all right. So I mentioned to our audience that I've worked with both of you, so I understand your business models. You don't have to attach a dollar sign to it, uh, but we did have a question come in from the audience about the actual business models of you two and and how they work. So maybe just quickly define kind of how your practice works and, and what do people actually pay for? So my business model is fairly simple. I get paid by companies to go find people for boards or to do consulting for their board. So, you know, a, a local company will call up and say, hey, we need a board director, but it's not gonna be easy. We need somebody that lives in this geography we, with this experience that's this age and they're really specific. So if it was easy, they would have done it. So they, we get the difficult ones that, that, that a big companies go look for board, I shouldn't say big, but all size companies go look for specific board members. That's how we get paid. And Jim, is it a, a flat fee yep. or a monthly retainer? No, it's or? a flat fee, one-time fee that they pay us to go find somebody. Okay. And then, Ann, talk about your board readiness uh, program. Our program actually, um, you know, the core of our business has been transition, career transition support for executives. And so we, what we learned is a lot of times when executives were at those pivots in their career, boards were interesting to them. And that's what really led to us developing a board readiness practice as its own service area. So we are hired by um, primarily by individuals, sometimes by companies who think of this as a great way to get development for their most senior leaders. But we're hired to actually put a consultant beside the individual and to really um, take their um, take essentially their candidacy and make them much more successful in their board search. So we sit side by side and we are paid by the individual or by the company up front um, to provide that support and make sure the person can be a much more successful candidate. And we, we provide that support rather than being time-based or based on a number of meetings for us. We know some people are in a hurry, some people work more slowly. So we, we really do that um, based on getting the person ready and then being available so that when board interviews come up, uh, Jim, I thought the point you made earlier about being ready you know, the, the worst thing you can do is somebody calls you and says they've got a board opportunity and they think you're perfect. And then you take three or four weeks to get back to them with materials that don't look good. Yeah. And so you need to have your materials developed. And that's really where our business model shows up, Rick, is we work with people to get the branding and the materials and get themselves ready so they can get out there and start networking and then support them while they're doing that and while they're interviewing. Does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned earlier in our conversation that, um, like you said, some people go slower, some work faster. So maybe just give a range uh, of time that it takes to work through the process. Yeah, we found that somebody can have their materials ready. If they're really diligent, they can get their materials ready in a couple of months and they'll be in great shape. And that's assuming they've got a full-time job and they're, they're fitting this in. Um, but then it's, we, you know, we start to measure success by have they landed in that 12 to 18 month period from when they started with us. So that's what we look at as a success criteria. And then one, Jim. One thing, I'd like to add one thing to Ann, and, and that is because I've helped some people, you know, out of personal, you know, favor, I'd help them get on a board or even get ready for board. You have to look at the, this is coaching. You know, Ann and her team are going to be your coach and your mentor, they, they can't take their fingers up and go actually go and get you the position. Right. They're gonna get you ready for the position, no different than a than you know somebody, if you go to the gym and you get a, you get a coach or a trainer, it, it's the same type of thing. If the work still falls on you, and if you're willing to do that work, you'll have success. If you think they're gonna do it for you, it's not gonna be successful. That's exactly right. And then uh, Jim, uh, just, and I know it, it varies um, probably uh, widely, but 
what would your experience say is a typical uh, board search engagement that, that you conduct from a time perspective? You know, amazingly longer than you'd expect. And the reason that it's longer than you'd expect is um, <clears throat> that usually, a, you know, it's not like you lost your vice president of manufacturing or CFO and we need to replace them. And so there's a sense of urgency on both sides. They want to make the right choice. And frankly, you know, you're going after busy executives that once they engage, it's still hard to line up schedules and, and the like. And so it's, it can be, you know, board search can anywhere be from on the low end, 75 days, on the high end, 180 days that we've seen go. And, and everyone's comfortable with the pace. You got to be, it's, it's got to be ready to be a pace that everybody's comfortable with. Because, and remember, the board meets four times a year. You miss one board meeting, you know, now it's, well, it doesn't matter. We can get it done by the next three months to go, go by. So there's lots of gaps there. Jim, so has, has, the vir has the move to virtual with COVID sped up board search at all? I mean, has it changed how people are interviewing or the timeline? Uh, I would say no, it hasn't. It's a little bit, uh, um, you know, it, it's a little bit awkward. We actually hired a couple of board members all virtually. They didn't meet until they actually went to their first board meeting or they went to an onboarding session. Uh, but they felt comfortable doing this. Everyone's more comfortable in a Zoom or a Teams uh, environment. I um, and, and the other thing is, are there more board searches versus less? I haven't seen it change. The one thing is to remember that, you know, recessions don't affect boards. You know, they, they, you got to have the board. Recessions affect employees and things like that. They don't affect boards. And so, so it's not more or it's not less either. So I hear a lot, and I'm sure you do, uh, you two do as well. What are the most important traits that somebody can demonstrate to show that they're um, a great board candidate? What makes somebody an attractive board member? A um, couple things that, that I think is, is true here. Um, I believe they need to have an understanding of or contacts in the applicable business market or geography. I think uh, being a visionary, big thinker, big picture thinker is important certainly strong communication skills. And then um, I wouldn't um, rule out just the whole uh, EQ component of understanding the group dynamics, when to talk, when not to talk, that whole thing. Um, and then it goes without saying, and something that we talked about, Jim, a lot in the first one is people need to really be available and have the capacity and willingness to do the work and not just you know say that they want something added to their resume or they just want to you know, make a little extra money or, or what have you. But Jim, what do you see um, as the most important characteristics that board members should have? You know, I, I look at things, you know, your, your list was dead on right. You just exactly what people should be doing. I, I, I put it, try to put it in a term that we all could relate to as adults. So you need to be like an aunt or an uncle. So you think about your, your niece or your nephew that you're, you, and, you know, you think about it, it's like, you're not their parents, you're not raising them, you're close to them, and you can actually give them advice that they can take. But if they don't take your advice, not the end of the world, that's their life. But you need to have that mentality of a closeness, but not an ownership of it. And I, I, that's, and the second part of it is, is there other ways you can get some governance um, experience? So how... You know, think about governance, it's, it's being able to manage without owning it. Is there other ways you can do it through nonprofits are often a way to do it? But there's other things and maybe it's in the office. It's maybe it's organizing United Way campaign. It's other things that you can do. Definitely the number one thing that people like is having profit loss experience. So that financial acumen through, it's one thing to say, I can read it. I took a class on it. It's another thing to actually make the decisions of how you go about doing it. And then also you start early because it takes a long time, like Ann said, 12 to 18 months at best. You got to be patient and persistent and then keep on going with it. How about you, Ann? What do you think? Yeah, you know, I think it's, um, I was reminded, I was, um, I was in a group talking about boards recently and they brought up a comment that I used to hear from our board a lot at, uh, I think it was at Pepsi Americas where the board members talked about um, being noses in, fingers out. Yeah. You know, so being involved, but not doing. Um, I think you were saying it earlier when you were talking about brains versus brawn. But I think what that means is boards want a candidate who has a point of view, 
and is willing to speak up, but do it using that high EQ that you both referenced. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a trait. Um, you know, what's been interesting lately is to see how unique skill sets or expertise, you know, as, as the business environment is changing quickly around us, um, we're starting to see things listed on, on board specifications where people are looking for, we want somebody who's led transformation. You know, digital is everybody wants somebody who can rethink digital. I think diversity, equity, and inclusion is becoming something where people are looking to bring that expertise into the company. Um, and then sustainability. Those are the kind of things that are starting to pop as those unique skill sets, because it used to all be P&L. And I think now people are saying, we want that financial acumen and P&L depth, but we need somebody who can help us with this. Yep. So there's there's a few of those. Yep. So, so, you know, I know that um, we've talked about this in the past, Rick, and, and the like is, you know, a nonprofit board is different than a for-profit board. And for-profit boards are generally harder to get on. But so talk about, because you've been on both. And so talk about how you um, how you see the difference. Because I know that like you've been on the zoo board and you and, and then you also have been um, on investment boards that of companies you put money in, and then you're on the bank board. So you've seen all of those different iterations. How do you look at them differently? Sure. Jim, well, last time we talked about uh, my three Ds for the nonprofits. The nonprofits are looking for doers, door openers, and donors. And so I'd start with that for the nonprofits. And then also, if you have a passion for their cause and you have some visibility and credibility in the community, that plus, again, being able to be a doer, a door opener, or a donor will probably get you an audience just by reaching out to them directly which is different than the for-profit board. Most of the time, uh, the for-profit boards, as you both know, are looking for a specific set of criteria and that there is a structured search process. And those uh, opportunities really are few and far between. So as you both have mentioned, it's really done through networking. So to me, those are the two main differences between the two types of boards. Um, and uh, what do you think about this? You know, I think um, I, I personally have a huge commitment to the, to the nonprofit community. And I think when people are looking at board work, the thing they have to be a little careful of is we, we frequently have um, a client say, well, I've been, on a, I've been on a nonprofit board, so I could be on a for-profit board. And that is not a popular comment in for-profit boardrooms. <laughs> so you've got to be able to translate because large nonprofits can be great places to learn about board experience and good governance if they have that in place. Not all nonprofits have that in place. So I think as you're, as you're thinking about where you would wanna put your nonprofit effort, I always think it's about your personal passions. If you're using it as a stepping stone, not using it, but if it's one of the things you're looking to do in your strategy to, get, to make yourself a better board member, make sure that you're finding one that's got good governance um, and then think about the, you know, think about watch, watch out for the time intensive part of those boards. Um, but, you know, a nonprofit board can be a great way to build out your network. It's oftentimes as people are sitting on a nonprofit board, um, you know, they look around the room and what they realize is that's a group of people they should be talking about, about their interest in a paid board role. So my, my biggest watch out is just don't go into a board interview telling people because of your, because you've been chair of a nonprofit, that you know, you'll be a great board member for them. You're going to have to link why, what you learned about governance, what experiences you had and, and how that matches. Um, Jim, what do you think? So I think uh, you guys have covered it really well is that uh, one of the reasons why you go on a nonprofit also, do you even like governance? Because <laughs> governance, I mean, that's a, that's a big, big question. So do, just don't assume that, oh, I, I, I really like the idea of having all the authority and none of the responsibility. That sounds like a college kid, right? And, and so I, I look at say, do you like it? And then the second thing is with these some of these significant nonprofits, there's two types of board members. There's there's the board members that make up like the executive committee or the or the finance committee. They make the real decisions. Then there's everybody else, the other 35 to come to the thing and and just have a good time or just like to talk about things. And and so if you're on one, if it's got it may or may not have good governance, but there's somebody that's making real decisions, try to get into the inner circle. That's if you're going to do the nonprofit. So 
So it's come up a little bit today. I want to dive into it a little bit more. Uh, boards are looking for diverse candidates today more than ever. Uh, what's the impact and how has it changed your work process um, and what your companies uh, do to go, to go about searching for that diversity? Jim, uh, let's start with you. Uh, I think diversity is a wonderful thing. And, and, but I look at diversity in an expanded view. There's four, there's four pillars of diversity. There's age, geography, race, and gender. And, what, and so why do I think it's a great thing? It opens, expands more potential for the people that are watching this, they're gonna have more of an opportunity because, because more boards realize that diversity helps their business run better. Over 70% of the searches we get asked to do and get contracted to do have a diversity component. Those four things they talked about. They're gonna ask, and, and generally speak, the one, one that everybody was all excited about the last three years has been gender, because they're just women who are underrepresented on boards. And so they, they would always say, all things being equal, we don't, we, we don't have to have this, but I'd rather have a woman than a man, just because, um, because we need more diverse thought. We need a different perspective on the, on the board. So it's, I think it's been very, very good. And especially because boards are just not, a, you know, they used to talk about the old white guys. They're just not those anymore. They're, they're, it's much more diverse experience-wise as well as backgrounds for people and they get better decisions out of it. What are you thinking? I think you did a great job of answering it from a, you know, from a search perspective mm -hmm. um, and from a, we know diverse boards give better results. Mm -hmm. um, I know you said age. What I thought was interesting, the one aspect of diversity that I've heard talked about a little bit more is that idea of generational. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we want millennials on our board. We want so I think there's, I think search firms are absolutely being asked to produce diverse slates. If I put on my hat around our board readiness practice, you know what 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 that means in terms of advice that we give our clients is that you know think about the diversity you can bring to a board. Is a diversity of perspective? Is it one of the aspects of diversity that Jim talked about? I mean, you need to think about that as you market yourself. You need to recognize that um, that if you're a diverse candidate, then connecting with search firms makes even more sense because search firms are being asked to put diverse candidates on the slate. Um, so it can help you modify the strategy that you use when you when you go to market. But you know, the thing we have been doing quite a bit is that we've been helping all of our candidates think about how do they articulate the importance of diversity to a business and how do they make sure that when they show up, they're ready to answer questions about what they've done to improve their own cultural competency. Mm -hmm. Because um, you know it's not as simple as, can I check the box and are you a diverse candidate? If you're a member of a board, they're gonna, the board needs to know that you understand that it's important, that you can talk about why it would be important to that business and that you can talk about the things you've done to improve your own cultural competency and your awareness of, um, of what's happening in the world from a diversity, equity, and inclusion standpoint. So it's an interesting time. And I think it's, um, you know, the good news is I think we've figured out that boards are going to be better um, if they've got that diversity. Right. But there's a lot of other things happening out in the board environment. And Jim, I was wondering, um, I see there's some new NASDAQ requirements for boards. Right. And I wondered if you could share outlines and what you think the impact's going to be of those new requirements. So, you know, this is, what's interesting about this is everybody goes, thinks it's going to change overnight, right? Well, California passed a law three years ago. Right. About, about having, you know, X number of women on boards and stuff like that. But they give them a long lead time to do this. Same thing with NASDAQ. This is, this is not a requirement, but, but yet, but it's being proposed. So they still got to turn it into a requirement. And, the, and it's okay. really, it fundamentally is around um, not so much you have to have it, but you have to disclose it. And so, and, and, and they have, um, depending on the, what type of a NASDAQ company's on, you've got four to five years to implement this. So that's a, that's going to give you plenty of time. So you're going to see it. I mean, the, the women on boards, um, I was part of the organization, Women on Boards 2020, it's now called 50-50. They achieved in, in 10 years, they got it up to 20%. So by just focusing on it, it's going to change. And I think that's what will happen with this. But nobody is absolutely going to have to do it today or tomorrow. 
but just the awareness of it is going to make people move the needle in that direction. So a reminder to everybody, um, we're with Jim Zelke of Cardinal Board Services and Ann Sample of Navigate Forward. If you're in YouTube, you can see their contact information there. Um, again, hit the subscribe and hopefully the like button uh, as you're in uh, YouTube. Um, and if we get another question or two here in the last uh, minute or so, uh, we might be able to weave another question in uh, while, we're, um, while we're waiting to see if anybody else has a question. Why don't I put one kind of summary question towards you two. Um, if there was one kind of key takeaway that you'd like to leave the audience with, what would it be? I know we covered a lot of ground today. I think it was a great session. Um, and it does not necessarily need to be something that we got to today. It might be something we didn't have time for. Um, but what would be the one key takeaway you'd like to leave with everybody? So for me, I, I like to use these analogies and examples. It, this is very much like you decide you want to run a marathon. You saw some, you got to go watch your friend do it and go, this is something I want to do. You know, if you're going to run a marathon in the Twin Cities Marathon next October, it's a huge commitment. There's a lot, lot of preparation, a lot of training, and it's a lot of hard work to get there. And, and, and so you should, first off, you should start doing some 5Ks and 10Ks, see if you even like it. But then, but then if, if you're doing okay, it's gonna, it's gonna take work. And that's the thing you, you should realize if you wanna be on a board, it's gonna take work for you to get on board. I, I love your analogies, Jim. I would have, uh, mine's not the analogy, mine would have been just reminding people that a board search takes focus, patience and persistence. Um, your, your analogy of a marathon is a great one. Um, the thing we haven't talked about, maybe that would be just an add on to that is that some people think, well, I'm gonna wait until I retire and I have time. Um, it is harder to get on a board once you've retired because the relevance of your experience starts to come into question on day one. And so my counsel is get on your first board while you're working, yep. you know, fit it in, make sure it fits from a timing standpoint, but I love the marathon analogy. And I think that's the thing folks have to realize is they've got to do the work and they've got to start way before they want to join a board. And Ann, for uh, somebody that'd like to reach out to you, what's your email? It's Ann, Ann and E at navigateforward.com. And Jim, yours? Uh, Jim Z at cardinalboardservices.com. Okay, so Jim, we are gonna be doing other parts of this series together. So I look forward to that. And Ann, we've had you on Clubby before. Is this uh, number, um, number two or number three that you've been with us? I think it's, it's at least, it's two on this topic. How's okay. that, Rick? All right, well, uh, we're glad to have you here. And actually just under the gun, had one last question. Um, uh, Alvin wanted to know, do board assignments ever lead to consulting work or paid employment? So one last question right under the wire. I did one. And, and I got, I, I was asked to find a board of directors for a small private company. They said, we're not sure our CEO is the right guy. So we want to make sure the person we bring on might potentially become the CEO and did about nine months later. So it does, okay. does lead to more. And Anne? It can. I think you shouldn't go into it for that reason, but it can. Yeah. It okay. can. All right. Well, thank you very much, uh, you two, for joining uh, Club E today. Look forward to having you both again soon. And uh, thank you very much. Take care. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you.